just give a quick introduction to myself. And I'm going to stand over here so Karen and I can be in there together. Okay. Um, so I have been investing in real estate for over 20 years. Um, I, right there? Okay. I, <laughs> I own, let's see, 13 doors, two are short term rentals, the rest are long term rentals. I came from corporate America. I'm a CPA, but I don't practice it. Uh, but about, well, it was about 2018. I was just done with the current job I was doing, and my husband was like, "Why don't you do something with this real estate?" And I got my license and realized quickly that I have a passion for helping others build up what I built, but better than I built. I made lots of silly decisions in the past, like, well, this looks like a great house, let's buy it. <laughs> no numbers ran, right? Um, and I was like, well, if we could bring in specialists and help other people educate other people so they can do it quicker and smarter than I did, um, or realize I don't want to be a real estate investor at all, because that's how some people end up, um, and that's okay, right? Um, so that's that's my background. I got into helping others about in 2018. So, so and I was a kindergarten teacher and loved teaching people. So when I became a real estate agent, um, because my family was barely making ends meet in 2015, and we bought our first um, investment property, and it changed our lives. And like just this morning, I said to my husband. We bought that for sixty-three thousand. It's now worth two hundred and seventy thousand, and um, so that just created that passion for real estate for me. And then when I met Amy, that passion for teaching combined with you know helping people create that opportunity and potential with real estate, we came together to create these classes. All right. So we'll do a quick view of this is sort of disclaimer to let you guys know we are not like CPAs or, or lawyers so we'll talk about some of those things today but seek advice um, this is Karen and I's five steps to successful real estate investing <coughs> this is kind of how we built our class how do we how do we educate people around these five steps and bring in specialists who know things better than even we do uh, we, so we started, we decided we wanted to do a give back to the community. Um, we wanted to provide consistent education, which is this class. We wanted to help people with an investor consultation to say, if I'm just thinking, oh, my neighbor told me I should invest in real estate, is it for me? We do this consultation, it takes about an hour, we ask you lots of silly questions, and at the end, you kind of realize if you're ready or not if you even want to be an investor, um, and you can take, or you'll have set goals and be on a path to achieving them. We also have an investor analysis sheet that I'll get into here in a second that we give free to our clients to use to run numbers on properties. And we do annual real estate reviews, both on your own home, to kind of know the equity you have in your home, uh, as well as your rental properties. Here's our classes we have coming up. This is this QR code will get you to the Eventbrite to sign up for them. So the next class is transitioning into commercial. So that would be a great. We got a lot of people from our commercial team coming to present that time. Well, can you go back for a sec? And on um, September 11th, we have a fix and flip field trip, Nick. So put that one on your calendar. We're gonna actually, yeah, we're gonna go and analyze a, a flip. Yeah, so a lot of fun classes coming up, and we'll, you know, if there's anything that you guys are curious in learning, let us know. We'll get it on the, the docket and find a specialist for next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my, I've tagged this as mine. How you make money in real estate is through cat pee. It's not by not having cat pee in your rentals. It's not that, but that's important too. Uh, it's a lot of people have, people have a hard time remembering how you make money, all the different uh, faucets for making money in real estate. And so I was like, there's got to be something that works with these letters. And I came up with cash. <coughs> so cash flow is what most people think about. Like, what am I getting in my pocket each month after I pay all my expenses out? Oh my gosh, this keeps changing. <coughs> Appreciation is what people talk about. What is, what is your value of your home going up? 
or down, it can go down, yeah, depreciation, right? Tax savings, uh, because of our tax law, you can have income that you're getting from your rental properties and you don't pay taxes on them now. It's, it's kind of deferred. And then the principal buy down for um, the money that your tenants are paying to pay down your debt. And that's my cats right there. That's Raina, <coughs> Raina and Petal. They're gonna be the star of the show. So I wanted to bring in, and this is new. This this is just to kind of show you. This is our now. This is one of the output screens of our tool that we created for analyzing a rental property before you buy it. We also have one to analyze if you already own it and you want to turn it into a rental. Um, but you can see here, you know, a lot of my clients will just go, this is a real active listing right now, if anyone's looking Colorado Springs for this price point. Um, but, you, but to show you, you can actually get to cash flow positive if that's what you want. But this, some people are just, we have one investor that comes, he's not able to make it tonight, but that comes frequently. He is not, he is, he, his main goal is tax savings. He makes a ton of money and he needs to offset it with tax savings. So his goal is, is different. Um, but you can clearly see cat pee on the sheet and determine are these returns the ones I want. And of course, all of these are based on assumptions that are on the first tab that you enter. Um, so it's not, um, this, this is based on the assumptions I put in, which is like a 4% appreciation and 3% rental growth and that kind of stuff. And then there's a five year look. Um, and this is even at the seven and a half interest rate. Now, do you have to put down payments? Yes, you got to put at least probably, this is a 30% down payment to make it cash flow flat um, for this scenario. But the difference, the current and the potential is really the difference between if I invest in a little bit of this property, can I get a higher rent? So this this is if you don't make some improvements, this is if you do. But we teach you how to run this whole tool and, and you can take it and run it on anything you want. Um, this is kind of how Karen and I work together. We're actually separate companies. We have our own, we're our own real estate business. But we've found that we are super valuable together because we both have different traits that are successful. So this is kind of our model. I do the follow-up, I do the client consultation, I train you on how to use that sheet. And this is new since we've started working with you, so we're changing oh. it a little bit. Okay. Um, but so it's really clear who does what in using our best strengths. And so I will do the consultation, I'll, I'll see if you are to be an investor, um, I'll document your goals. If you are, I'll document what property you should be targeting. Um, do all the contractual stuff between us together and then Karen takes it because Karen is amazing at so I, I'll take you out on the showings <coughs> and bring you back to your goals as we're doing showings and um, just you know answer your questions and walk you through that process help you get under contract and negotiate inspection and get you to closing so that's, I'm good at motivating she is the goal that achiever. win win. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm i good at uh, the number crunching and all that and helping you set your goals. Yeah, so when, I, when I'm out with you on the road at showings, we'll, I'll call Amy and say, run numbers on such and such an address, and then she'll spit that back to us. Yeah. So we make a good team. Yeah, and I we want you to learn how to do that, but in the short term, like if you need help getting those numbers ran, definitely. We have a Facebook group. This is where this video that we're doing right now and many of our past videos are. So if you guys want this at the end, uh, join the group. You don't have to be on Facebook and have a Facebook account to join this group. Some people have that question. Uh, but we also put random articles and market data. We always do a market update. Uh, we have a lender that does a really good one. What's um, the name of it, the Facebook group? Uh, it's Colorado Real Estate Investing 101. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you don't want to scan the QR code, you can just get to it that way. Oh, I see. And that's how um, we share additional information outside of this class. And now we'll get to our wonderful guest speaker. Wanna... Yeah, so um, Will, Will has been a family friend for 20, 20 22 years. years. Um, and then 
um, also became our financial advisor and um, my son also worked for him and so um, we trust him completely with all things financial so we're excited to have Will here. And Will is also my fi financial advisor and I will tell you I interviewed a lot of them because I am I think I don't know the percentage but a large percentage of my investments are real estate and I needed someone who to, sh to show my overall picture and that's how I selected you guys because you were able to give me all the pretty models and stuff with my real estate and he is also a real estate investor so he understands how real estate works too so so Thank you. all right so as Amy and Karen mentioned, I am Will Allen. Um, I was, I've been in financial planning now for 17 years. Uh, prior to financial planning, I actually worked as a, a middle school social studies and language arts teacher. Realized very quickly that there was a lot more in store, so I actually transitioned into the financial planning world. I spent 13 years of my career at a big box downtown firm. Uh, just felt like clients more or less just became a number on a piece of paper. Transitioned over to Cedrus, which is the financial planning firm I'm with now. Um, and I can tell you it's it's a dream space that I'm in, just helping people um, prepare for long-term retirement planning needs, short-term needs, things <clears throat> of that nature. Um, I am a certified financial planner. Um, Roughly 25% of advisors carry that CFP designation. Um, I am married, I do have three kids, uh, 19, seven, uh, soon to be 17, and a bonus baby we threw into the mix who's eight years old. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to kind of discuss the overall area of budgeting. Um, I would love to hear from you guys what you all currently do with regards to budgeting strategies. Um, so I guess we'll just kind of go around the room in terms of how do you guys prepare budgets, things of that nature. What do you mean, like a monthly budget? Or? Yeah, like a monthly budget. Some people will plug things into like an Excel spreadsheet and they rectify it like six weeks later and that has tended to not uh, be a very successful way in terms of managing a budget. Uh, so I guess I'd like to just dialogue. Yeah, well, I have an MBA in finance. And, okay. Uh, I don't do any kind of budget. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I understand. I tried, and it's it's not easy. So I you know I keep track of my finances, kind of. And I got a savings account, put money into for a lot of purchases. But okay, you know, no, it's not. What about you? For the last seven years, I've been a consultant for bigger companies. Okay. Consultant for procurement. These are projects which could last three months, six months, sometimes 20 months. So this means no guaranteed income mm -hmm. if you want. Yeah, so like our income. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sporadic. This means, this means no monthly budget, just having some pile of money sitting somewhere. Okay. And using it when it's necessary. Yeah. All right. And then investing shares. Okay. Yeah, what about you? it's funny because you know with, I have a CPA license and I, I don't even. There, there was no. I actually wrote down a budget because I remember when we met. You were yeah. Like, What's your budget? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> Let me pull out my credit card. I guess. <coughs> it's like, okay, off my credit card every month. Yeah. Um, I actually just because this last year for real estate sales was. Look, like transactions everywhere across the U.S. were low. It wasn't just me, right? Yeah. So I felt the pain, um, and my husband was like, "What are we? Why are we always? Why are we spending? Like, what are we spending on?" I was like, "I don't know. Let's find out." So I, I literally wrote out a piece of paper. Yeah. A, finally, a budget for us. Yeah. And and explain, and we were able to look at that and cut some things out that uh -huh. we were spending on, or just be more aware of it. Um, but. That's kind of the end of it. And okay. I need to go to the next step because I have lots of dreams. You know, we want to buy another investment property, but I yeah. don't have cash flow in today's market to do that. Right? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm excited for this just cool. to know that and how to get to the next step. Yeah. Karen? So um, 
our budget has always been, can we pay all our bills at the end of the month? Okay. So when commission is good, we spend more, and when commission is lower, we spend less, and that's one of my goals for this year is to have a consistent budget. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to learn. So I use Google Sheets okay. that have every every single dollar of income on there, <laughs> nice. and every expense, and every debt, and I have it, I have it planned out until um, kind of like fall of twenty twenty five. Okay. So every month, like what I do, it matches up with what with reality. Yeah. So, you know, what I'm saying like I plan yep. it, I plan it in a certain way. So yeah. Yeah. So okay. I. I watch the winner. Dollar. You are the winner. Yeah. yeah. You know what? <laughs> For you know what? Sure. Once you start doing it, it, it's addicting. It really is. It's addicting. Like, you really, like, I don't know. It's just really weird. But. Yeah. Well, budgeting is, in my mind, very important. And the reason it's so important, because if you're able to manage the dollars and cents that come in your door, but more importantly, you're able to manage the dollars that go out of your household. Yeah. That's the true secret to saving. And saving is what ultimately builds wealth over the course of time. And if you don't have a good handle in terms of what you're spending month over month, you're basically digging yourself in a hole. And then you're scrambling, you're waking up one day, you're 55, 60 years old, and you're like, I've got nothing socked away from my retirement. So. It is important for you to have kind of a tool in place with regards to um, your month-to-month -month budget. Um, in addition to that, I am a Dave Ramsey Smart Vester Pro. Uh, what a Dave Ramsey Smart Vester Pro is, uh, Dave Ramsey is a very, um, yeah. like, very huge talk show. He's got a podcast. Um, he's got a goatee ball. <laughs> um, but he is all about, like, no nonsense when it comes to uh, like how you create wealth and how you create wealth is basically through what he refers to it's just the right arrow mm -hmm. I click okay. maybe there you go basically he refers to it as <coughs> his seven baby steps so baby step number one is to have a thousand dollar emergency fund money that you can readily access at the bank in the case um, crap hits the fan and you're like, hey, I gotta, I gotta attend to my water heater just going out or my car needs um, some maintenance done on it. You have a thousand dollars that you can immediately grab from and pay, pay off that emergency type need. The next step is the whole debt snowball. Debt snowball basically refers to any non-consumer debt that you have outside of your mortgage whether it be a credit card, car loan, student loan, he would say, let's start with your smallest debt first and work on tackling that smallest debt. The next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna take, if you're plowing away $100 at our smallest loan, we're gonna plow that same $100 plus the minimum payment to the next uh, largest um, balance loan. And the whole idea is if you view a, a snowball at the top of the hill, as that snowball begins to roll downhill, it gains more and more traction as you get towards the bottom of the hill. And he likes you to wipe off the liabilities or the debt side of your balance sheet because that's kind of the way in which we can kind of build wealth for ourselves over the course of time. So doing a debt snowball. Next thing is three to six month emergency fund. What a three to six month emergency fund is is if you spend five grand month over month, basically having 15 to $30,000 socked away at a local bank credit union. I always, in this day and age with like money market rates, high yield savings being in the 5% range, I always say get that three to six month emergency fund working for you. Um, and that's a good way to kind of get your money at the bank going for you. The next thing is baby step number four, save 15% towards your retirement. Um, an excellent vehicle is a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA is basically where you can, in essence, have tax-free growth of your money over the course of time, 
which is a huge um, benefit to you when you ultimately retire uh, to have a tax-free bucket of money to ultimately draw down from. Um, baby step number five is save money for your kids' college funds. Baby, six, uh, <clears throat> baby step six is to pay off your house early. And my personal uh, favorite is baby step number seven. It's the true idea of financial freedom where you're now building wealth and you're able to give, like whether it be a charitable interest through a church or an organization that's near and dear to your heart, that's a cool thing to do. Um, how we create budget savings is we're gonna manage our expenses, track expenses. So go back and look at your credit cards. Where are you tending to spend money? Is it you're spending money eating out? Is it you're spending money like figuring out what the needs of your four walls ultimately are, figuring out how much you need to spend to allocate towards rent, how much you need to allocate towards your gas and electric, how much you wanna to allocate towards a cell phone bill. Um, you wanna establish these habits early on. That's very, very important. And of course, this is contrary to the, the government. You wanna spend uh, less than you earn. The government has an overspending tendency. We want to make sure that you're spending less money than what is ultimately coming into your house. So it would be a bad deal if you're making a thousand dollars per month and you're spending twelve hundred dollars. That's like counterintuitive to what a budget's designed for. And the whole purpose is we budget so that we can ultimately save. Uh, I tell clients that I work with all the time. It's the expense side that ultimately drives the success of your financial plan. If you're spending more than you're ultimately making, you're like creating a negative cash flow situation. We want to create a positive cash flow situation so that we're building your balance sheet in the correct direction. 10% uh, rule for savings if you're making hundred grand, it's good to try to save at least $10,000 um, year over year in terms of what you're doing. Questions on that? I'm gonna grab a wad real quick. So how we set up a budget, we determine your income, we calculate your monthly expenses. Your monthly expenses are basically everything that's driving your month-to-month -month expenditures, whether it be rent, gas, groceries, all that fun stuff. Um, some people do what are known as sinking funds. Sinking funds are just the whole idea of, hey, we're going on a trip to Costa Rica in 2025. We need to account for the fact that that vacation, I don't know what that vacation is gonna cost you, Diana, but it might cost you five grand. We need to account for how are we going to save up for that expense between now and the time you ultimately go on that great trip. So you have basically 12 months. If you're trying to save five grand, you in essence need to save $400 month over month. And some people will throw that into a sinking fund. A sinking fund is just something that you're earmarking for a specific need. So another example of like a sinking fund would be hey, I need to replace my car. Let's start throwing that into a sinking fund. That's earmarked for that. Um, track your spending. How you track your spending is you pick a budgeting plan. For you, you have Google Sheets. For others, you might select a free app that's available um, through the App Store. Um, Every Dollar is uh, an app that Dave Ramsey uses. Uh, the every dollar app I love in the fact that it's just a good way for you to set up your month to month budgeted type of expenses, but it's a real time tracking mechanism in terms of if you've got $500 allocated towards gas, um, you're at the gas pump and you're pumping gas and you're topping it off and your total is $80, you go into the every dollar app and you physically plug in, I just spent $80. And it will give you a real-time total in terms of you only have $420 left in that gas category. 
Um, so having kind of a, a daily accountability <coughs> partner, having a daily mm -hmm. accountability partner through a great tool like the Every Dollar app is an excellent, excellent way for you all to have that kind of uh, head over your shoulder in terms of, Karen, did I overspend in the eating out category? And when you get towards the end of the month and you see, hey, I've only got uh, $50 left in my grocery allowance, like that's the whole idea. Dave Ramsey is a big proponent of, well, you're gonna have to live off rice and beans. So just having things with regards to real-time tracking mechanisms are gonna really, really help you guys with regards to creating good spending habits. This is, yeah, question. Have you, yeah. have you used Mint? I've heard about Mint yes, before. I have used Mint. I prefer the Every Dollar app over Mint, but a lot of my clients, um, they, they're proponents of Mint in terms of kind of the linking capabilities. Um, I just am a creature of habit with regards to, hey, I'm a smart investor pro. I'm gonna kind of subscribe to Dave's philosophy of every dollar. Yep. So I have every dollar and I started and then yep. just cool. stopped. Yep. <laughs> so first, of, well, two questions. How, advice on not stopping and how does it work when you have a family and then people are spending? Yep. Can you combine? Yep. That? So with the every dollar app, you can certainly have a same unique login if you're a husband wife type situation you can have your spouse have the every dollar app on their particular device you log in through the same kind of portal so to speak and it does fortunately talk to each other with regards to hey mike just spent 50 dollars at the grocery store i know now know that we have 50 dollars less in the grocery category um again these are little habits that you really need to just, I mean, it's the little things that create great, great um, habits for us later in life. Um, there's a cool book out there, it's called Atomic Habits. It's the whole idea of like doing small things each and every day, produce big results later on. And it's hard as you're kind of going through the trenches early on, on all of this, but it's important for if you are married or you're um, sharing expenses with someone to have kind of weekly, regular, periodic budget type meetings in terms of, hey, what's working? What's not working? Um, just so you can kind of create success for your overall family. Well, I also have noticed too that as we're talking about it more, because I have two high schoolers. Yes, and they're, they're expensive. They're, so I'm the spender. Okay. My family and my husband is the non-spender. <laughs> and so what was funny is I took them out and I was and we were shopping and I could hear him through them. Like yeah. they were saying, you know what, I actually I really don't think I need that. It's not yeah. a need or we've we've already spent too much this month. Like and yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to beat that. Like, I, I don't want to be like known as like mom blows all of our money and dad. Um, but so I started like figuring out, okay, we in communicating with the kids, I was like, we've ate out, we've like just numbers, I'm using an app, but in my totally. head, yeah. like we've already spent this much in groceries. Yeah. Um, we can't afford to eat out this many times because I've been, I've been using some of that conversation with the kids. It's been really cool to see them react and like process and then you see them doing it. Like yeah. they go to Starbucks with their friends and they decide not to get the Starbucks because they don't really need it. It was just, you know, so <coughs> that's, I guess to me, that's the other thing that's really driving me to be better at this Yeah, is what I can teach them and how they can be different in their lives. Totally. Because of it. At yeah. their age, if they start being smarter, just like my real estate investments, if I was smarter, if they're smarter with their savings, they're going to be more successful. Exactly. Yeah. I'm Olivia's husband. Jennifer's a helicopter. And you know what it is? Yes. Oh, is it not coming back on? So yeah, it's not coming back on. I mean, it's dead. Part of the bar's in there. I got sent over, and she's like, <clears throat> she's like, here's the, you know, here's how you get in. I'm like, there's a bunch of people here, so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.
teenagers have every dollar? They do not, no. I mean, Whitney is a saver to and through. Okay. So she's very not likely to spend money. Mm -hmm. um, Noah's just getting into the realm of like getting a job, getting income. And um, I do think that, I mean, financial literacy is something that is very undertaught when it comes to schools. Um, and just having kind of a good basis with regards to what are the secrets? What are the secret ingredients that we need to do in order to create financial freedom? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, truthfully, the, the budget, the spending side of things is the biggest thing that gives people angst. It's the give, biggest thing that they're like, I don't have capacity to save. Mm -hmm. And it's, they don't have capacity to save because they haven't really been taught with regards to how do we create good habits to creating additional savings month over month. Okay, sorry. I'm like, how do I get this? Does anyone know on the access remote more than I do? Just, I don't see an X on there. Maybe it'll just go away in a second. There we go. There we go. I'm gonna pull this over here so I'm plugged in. So this is, this is just a sample budget here. This just gives you ideas with regards to how to set up your categories, whether it be your housing, rent, maintenance, homeowners association type dues, uh, to having more of your variable types, types of expenses, whether it be medications, another variable expense would be uh, water, water in the summer is going to tend to be higher than water in the winter because you're watering your grass. Um, then having things like a car replacement fund, that's the whole idea of a sinking fund, um, things of that nature. So this is just a simple sample budget um, that I could certainly provide to you guys after the meeting if you were like, hey, I'd like to get some tools in hand with regards to how I can begin to create better space in my life to have better savings um, habits moving forward. Um. <laughs> oh, good old technology. Next slide. Next. <laughs> Okay. There you go. Uh, perfect. <laughs> if you could be my slide advancer, that would oh, be great. No, oh, that works. All right. So this is just recommended allocations in terms of uh, savings. Goal with savings is to have 10 to 15 percent socked away. On the whole housing allowance piece, it would be 25 percent of your net take-home pay. Um, five to 15 percent for food five to ten percent for utilities like gas electric water um earmarking for clothing for myself i mean my wife gives me a clothing budget of like 50 dollars every year every so month. every year not every month every year um so my, my percentage you don't like to spend it <laughs> my percentage is more like one percent in this category um but medical health having like five to 10% allocated for that. Insurance, like life insurance, that's a very, very pivotal piece if you've got um, a family. Um, and then recreation, like doing fun things in life, like uh, whether it be going to the gym, things of that nature. Um, so those, this is just a sample guide in terms of figuring out your target percentage is taking your total income, multiplying it by the recommended percentage and then you can input the actual uh, dollar amount that you're spending. Um, you can use this formula to get your actual percentage, the budgeted amount, basically divided by your total monthly income, multiply that number by 100. This is just kind of a reader's digest version in terms of how you can begin to create a budget moving forward. So practical tips. Um, simple steps, 
create good habits of budgeting and saving. Um, step number two, establish credit. You can establish credit by basically being a loyal payer backer of the debt uh, that you've accumulated, whether it be on a credit card or a student loan, just creating good habits with regards to the bank loan me this money, I need to strategically pay that back. That's gonna help your overall uh, credit score in terms of the higher credit score you have um, in the future when it comes to your borrowing capability, um, the lower the interest rate's gonna ultimately be, which is great from um, a leverage standpoint, which I'm sure Amy and Karen are experts when it comes to leveraging debt. Um, it can also help with regards to things like buying a car in the future. Um, and then just having a plan to purchase a house when able, um, just the whole idea of creating good habits, saving more month over month. Once you've gotten that three to six month emergency fund, uh, you can begin to, depending on your time horizon, you can begin to look at investing that money um, and investing it in the stock market. If you look at the stock market historically, um, uh, less kind of dividends, the S&P 500, which is the standard and Poor's 500, it measures the 500 largest companies on Wall Street. It's given out roughly a 9.8% rate of return. Um, so the more you can kind of create these habits, the more you can do fun things like get into baby steps uh, four, where you're investing 15%. And that's where I really come into play with regards to creating good allocation strategies for how we can grow that bucket of money for you um, in a methodical way moving forward. Um, and then fourthly, start investing early. Um, there's a cool, if we go to the next slide. Uh, is that the end? Here, I got this. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to share a cool rule. It's called the rule of 72. Does anyone know the rule of 72? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Go ahead and well, share it with me. It's like your money I forget how it goes, but your money doubles somehow, or like when, you, when your money, you, you take, well, whatever. I don't know it exactly, but I heard of it. I know okay, it. cool. So you start with the number 72. You take an assumed rate of return. We're gonna keep math easy for purposes of this Wednesday oh, evening. You have to have 72 times what you need for money somewhere. No, we're gonna assume an average rate of return of 7.2. Oh. So you take 72 divided by 7.2. That gives you the number 10. That tells you that your investment is gonna double every 10 years. So if you've got $100,000 today, 10 years from now, you're gonna have 200,000. 10 more years, you're gonna have 400,000. 10 more years, you're, you're gonna have 800,000. It's just a cool idea with regards to the power of compounding interest over the course of time, with regards to how we can really like build your balance sheet, build your assets in the positive direction moving forward. Um, the last slide just, your just includes my contact information. Um, I have my business cards here. If you all ever just wanna sit down and do just a complimentary consultation, um, I really do try to help people with regards to four key planning areas. Uh, the first area I help with is just in the area of overall estate planning. Uh, just the whole idea, of if you pass on, do you have some type of written plan in place, whether it be uh, a trust, a basic will, I kind of walk through that whole landscape. The second area I help with is just in the area of uh, tax management. We want to be strategic um, in terms of how we look at your tax situation today, but we want to be very forward thinking in terms of how we look at your taxes in the future. The third area that I help with is just in the area of income planning. A lot of you all are just in this accumulation mode where you're just like, hey, Will told me to save, 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 save. 
well, there's going to become this magical finish line that you guys get to. It's called retirement, where you're going to, in essence, need to flip the switch from accumulation mode to distribution phase. Well, during that distribution phase, we want to be very good strategic thinkers in terms of what buckets of money are the most tax efficient buckets of money to ultimately pull from. But we want to be very forward thinking in terms of making sure that those assets don't exhaust themselves out. Like let's say you retire at age 65. We, we don't want you coming to me at age 75 and saying, well, I'm out of money. What have we done wrong here? So we're gonna kind of create an income plan around what all that looks like. And then the fourth area, any uh, wealth management advisor helps in this space is just in the area of portfolio management. Um, we've had an interesting couple years within the stock market. 2022 was just interesting from the aspect that it was the second time in history where for the first three consecutive quarters, you had both stocks and bonds being down. Um, the last time that event actually happened was the Great Depression. Um, so people during the whole 2022 year were like, hey, I'm in a bunch of losers. I'm in both stocks and bonds. Um, and the whole idea of having kind of your diversified 60% equities, 40% fixed income uh, portfolio that kind of went by the wayside because bonds were down 13%. Um, so I will hand out my cards at the end of this meeting. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to address those. But hopefully this was helpful any and informative. Any questions right now for Will? I, I have a quick yeah. Sorry. <laughs> just to, okay. Go ahead, Diana. Okay, just quickly. Um, what is your thought on a stock market crash this year? That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> It would be good. <laughs> that would be good. It, it could present a, I mean, a good buying opportunity. I I think if you look at kind of <coughs> the telltale signs that are out there, mm -hmm. you look at the fact um, that we have this inverted yield curve. You look at there's just so many kind of telltale signs with regards to strategists have been screaming recession over the last eighteen to twenty four months. Mm -hmm. Last year, they really got it wrong in the fact that the stock market went gangbusters on us. Um, so we are, in terms of our kind of portfolio allocation, we are being very strategic in terms of being more defensive in our um, investing models. When I say more defensive, we're investing uh, kind of more into consumer staples. Uh, you look at kind of the two companies on Wall Street that have the least amount of volatility, um, it would be Coca-Cola and McDonald's. Even during a recessionary type of environment, people are always gonna be drinking their Coca-Cola. They're always gonna be eating their Big Mac burgers. Even- Isn't McDonald's a real estate company? What? I thought McDonald's makes their money because they're real estate. Yeah, no, they, <laughs> they sell Big Macs. Amy. Yep, so, they are? Um, they are. They are. I definitely think that there are, like, there could be times of testing within the market. Um, and I do, I mean, some, it's amazing because you get all of these experts within the field and they are all across the board with regards to some people on the far, like, bullish side, the bullish side meaning they think the market's going to be up, they say, S&P is going to be up 9% by the end of the year. You look at the other side of the equation, some strategists say we're going to be down 10, 11%. I mean, the S&P is up 8 to 10% year to date. Um, I think that especially in light of the news today with regards to the CPI data coming back at 3.5%, the whole idea of this attempt to curb inflation where they're trying to bring targets down to the 2% um, inflationary target, the, they're going the wrong way on all of this. So because they're going on the, the wrong way on all of this, if the Fed does choose to cut interest rates, <coughs> I think it's, it's potentially gonna lead us back into a 2022 type of scenario. So I definitely think that there, there are testing ahead of us. Good question. Nick, um, a couple questions. First one, I guess is how do you how do you implement the sinking fund kind of 
practically you know, open a separate account or how do you Oh, that? totally. Just a sep separate bank account that's earmarked towards that particular need. Um, I've got plenty of clients within my book of business that it's not infrequent for me to run across like you've got like six or seven different checking accounts and they're like yeah each of those checking accounts have their own purpose. means and purpose for what they're trying to achieve so i think kind of the separation with regards to how you're allocating to that sinking fund month over month is going to be a lot easier than having just a big lump sum of money in your savings account and you're like I don't know what this is, what the purpose of this is for. Yeah, good question. So out of your point of view, what's the best way to invest into real estate? Is it like individual objects or is it like a realty income ETF? That's not an ETF, but it's like just O. Like a REIT? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of like real property, um, and that's where your your good friends Amy and Karen come into play. Okay, but what's better, a REIT or individual property? Individual property, for sure. Why? Well, REITs have liquidity restrictions a lot of times with regards to, they're super easy to get into, but in terms of getting out of them, they can be somewhat cumbersome to ultimately exit out of. Um, in addition to that, I love the whole kind of real property play because you've got both the cash flow potential, you also have the appreciation on that particular um, property and, and the, the tax the tax savings from mm -hmm. it all. The tax savings yeah. would be very different. Yeah. It just gives you more options on what when when and what you do with your money. Totally. Totally. Yeah. I mean a read is not giving you a tax advantage more no. tax disadvantage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. it's not a qualified dividend. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I I own two two rental properties and one took a loss this year, the end last year. Um, but the amount of tax savings that it saved me as a small business owner was just mind boggling. So but it was constantly rented out. Um, no, it was a short term. It's a short term rental, mm -hmm. and so short term rentals have dropped. So it took a it took a loss, but even though we took a loss, I I still, still made money cash. because yeah. I saved yeah. so much in taxes. Especially when you're in our scenario, and you can actually say you're a real estate professional. There's there's additional tax savings you can get, so it's not the same for everyone, but. Mm -hmm. All right, what other questions you guys have? Well, about the Roth IRA, do you have any advice about that? Kind of, um, I guess, use or? I'm 100% a, a proponent of Roth IRAs all the time, just having that tax-free growth in terms of an investment vehicle is tremendously pivotal. Um, I do think that depending on what your taxable situation looks like right now, like if you're a high income earner today, a lot of times if you've got like a 401k contributing more on a pre-tax dollar basis where you're in essence able to reduce your overall taxable load today, I think makes a lot of sense. Um, but then we do certainly explore what do Roth conversions look like if you say retire at the age of 65. A lot of times people have to take what are known as required minimum distributions from their pre-tax Bucket of buckets of money at the age of 75, that's when we begin to kind of have more of a tax planning strategy behind, hey, we've accumulated say $500,000 worth of uh, traditional IRA or traditional 401k type funds, um, beginning to slowly convert those after retirement when you're in a lower tax bracket. Um, but I'm a huge, huge proponent of A, the tax regrowth, that you as the investor get. But when you look at it more from an estate planning lens, um, if you're a non-spousal beneficiary inheriting those pre-tax funds, there's this whole 10 year spend down rule that says, hey, I've got two kids, 
they're inheriting a hundred grand a piece. They basically have a 10 year spend down uh, provision that basically says that $100,000 balance needs to be fully exhausted by the 10th year after your passing. Um, and they could be basically in the height of their income earning years and you're just piling all this extra income onto their particular situation. So we do try to be strategic in terms of how we look at your tax situation both now and in the future. Um, but overall, I mean, you've never met a bigger advocate of a Roth IRA than myself. Do you have clients that have real property in their Roth IRA? Not, not with our, we do all of our investing through Charles Schwab. Um, a lot of our stuff is invested in ETFs, exchange traded funds. Yeah. Um, SCHD. What's that? SCHD. Yeah. Is it, yeah, is that a ticker? That's uh, Charles Schwab. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> You're stuck. <there>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just started other people talk about using the Roth to invest in real, real property and then using that, you know, so you don't pay taxes on paying gains. Yeah. There's certain custodians that do that. Yeah. Um, you have to find the, the right one that specializes yeah. in that space. It's, it's really, I looked into it for myself personally, yeah. and um, the challenge is, is that everything has to happen in that. Yeah. You need a furnace filter for your rental. It's got to come out of that. So, like, the management of it was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're not, the whole benefit of one of the major benefits is the cat like the cash flow that you can eventually start getting from your rental property. You can't get that, it just goes back into it. Yeah. So I I do know people who've done it. Uh, it just wasn't a good fit for me personally. Because there's a couple agents in our office that have two properties I think in their IRAs. Or is it always Roth IRA? It can be in either one, right? It's called Pretty sure. it's a different it's called yeah. something different though. So one question I have is then for you mentioned the children's college fund. Do you know does Colorado or state colleges have any kind of uh, taxing plans or anything? Or yes, like they do. Yeah, I just wonder if you can yep. that. You can say so. So uh, the college invest five twenty nine mm -hmm. um, is the. I mean, it's managed by Vanguard. Um, if you do set up a 529, whether it be for kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, things of that nature, doing the Colorado, uh, the College Invest 529 is the best route to ultimately do. Um, and yeah, you get a very small minimum state income tax, tax deduction. Um, I'm a big, big proponent of the direct portfolio through College Invest. It doesn't have any type of advisor fees attached to it um, within the 529 space there is the ability to basically select like an age-based life cycle fund age-based life cycle fund is going to become more conservative the closer the beneficiary gets to um, graduation <coughs> high school graduation um, there's also a number of different index funds that you can choose in terms of investment strategies but then when your kid does go off to college, a lot of times if you're paying cash out of pocket, you can funnel money through the 529, realize that income, state deduction, and then pay the university directly out of that 529. The only problem is your kid has to go to college or else you lose that money. Yeah, but they've, in light of like Secure Act 2.0, they've integrated some interesting uh, lingo and the fact that you can now, I think up to $35,000 can be put into a Roth IRA, um, which is a cool yeah. tax-free vehicle that you can set the beneficiary up for long-term. Oh, so you can move it out? Yeah, you, you can move it out of the 529 into a Roth IRA, if whatever kind of residual balance okay. you have remaining from that. And if you have multiple kids, you can transfer. You can transfer between beneficiaries, another... yep. Yeah. Yep. So the benefits being a um, uh, state tax 
reduction. Yep. Uh, because there's nothing at the exactly. federal level, right? What's that? There's nothing at the federal nothing level. Nothing at the federal level. Yeah. Correct. Yep. So you put money for your kid into this five, what? 529. And so the leftover money can go to the Roth IRA. Of Correct. The yep. Okay. Up to 35,000. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I have about one semester saved up in mine. Okay. <laughs> now that I looked at Perfect. college prices, I was like, whoa. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so, good questions. How many Roth IRAs can you have? Do you know? You can have as many as you want, but you really? can only fund up to seven thousand dollars, eight thousand if you're right. That's what I'm saying. So if you want to put in more than seven thousand per year, can you have a bunch or no? Okay. No, it, they take the collective balance okay, across okay. all Roth okay. IRAs. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a That's the interesting way to game the yeah. system. I've got ten Roth IRAs. I know, right? I can get seventy grand. <laughs> but but you can get seventy grand a year. Give to your yes. kids, yeah. and that doesn't count as yours, right? Well, your kids have to have earned income. Yeah. Anyone who's contributing into a Roth or a traditional um, IRA, they have to have earned income. Uh, allowances from mom and dad, unfortunately, do not qualify as earned mm -hmm. income. Working mm -hmm. for their parents' real estate business. Sure. Us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is true. So Luke just opened a Roth IRA. Did he? And yeah, and because he has earned income now. Um, okay. Yeah, and I'm like, wow, fifteen. That's pretty impressive. That I is pretty I impressive. Been. I did that for all my kids. I just did, they all have Roth IRAs. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I always say like if. Assuming your income is in the limit, I'm always a proponent of putting that first seven grand into a Roth or eight grand if you're over the age of 50, um, just so you can take advantage of that tax regrowth over the course of time. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, huge win for you, not the government. Is that better than putting, are you, would you first put it into your 401k or in like situation? The SEP or whatever. Right? Yeah. Is do you put into that first and then the Roth or? So, with that that's a situation where you certainly want to talk through like on an individual type basis. basis. Okay. Um, because it all depends on whether you need the tax free at the exactly. end of retirement, right? Yep. 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 Totally. It's all about money. Right. It's like a big checkbook. Right? It is like a big checkbook. <laughs> big money <laughs> checkbook. <laughs> Well, exactly. thank you so much, Will. Thank you. That's great.